Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, and because we do have uh, introductions for a minute or two. My name is Danny Weiss, and I'm a neonatologist at Sunnybrook and the director of the TNE program uh, here at Sunnybrook and also at the University of Toronto, along with my co chair of the NHRC curriculum committee, Dr. Danielle Rios from the University of Iowa. My pleasure to welcome everybody to the third year of the NHRC targeted neonatal echo foundations curriculum. I found a fundamental and uh, curriculum for uh, human dynamics trainees, uh, both uh, in North America, Europe, South America, and uh, around the world. Um, very pleased that we have our uh, human dynamics trainees joining as panelists on these sessions, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining as a seminar attendee. Um, a few housekeeping issues. One is an acknowledgement of the support from Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, uh, who provide an unrestricted educational grant to allow this foundation's curriculum to move ahead. So we're grateful for their support. Before we do get started, I did want to provide a shameless plug for the uh, NHRC upcoming conference. It's the Dr. Regan Giesinger Clinical Cardiopulmonary Physiology for the Care of the Sick Newborn Course. Uh, it is a uh, very modestly priced um, uh, conference on human dynamic content far and wide, and it is uh, very, very strongly recommended, uh, and certainly, I think, applicable to everyone who is joining us on the call today. And of course, uh, we do have session evaluations, and I'll be posting this QR code um, after at the end of our broadcast as well. Uh, and without further ado, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our eminent speaker today, Dr. Phil Levy, is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and neonatologist at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, he is well known on the hemodynamic circuit and one of the best speakers in the world. And so really grateful for him taking the time today to, uh, to join us. Uh, his research initiatives focus on cardiac mechanics and congenital and acquired cardiopulmonary diseases. And his research is part of a larger international collaborative that was established to examine emerging measures of cardiac function and pulmonary hemodynamics in large preterm birth cohorts to define physiological pathological patterns of postnatal cardiac adaptation. Uh, Dr. Levy is speaking with us today on the first uh, session of the year, um, really as a, an overview of targeted neonatal echocardiography. So for everyone who has joined today, you made an excellent decision because uh, it's going to be a fantastic talk. And Dr. Levy, I'm pleased to hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you so much for that um, uh, wonderful and humbling uh, introduction. As I put up my slides, I just want to just congratulate Danny Yu and Danielle and Laura for, for kicking off this third year um, with this uh, extremely important uh, foundational series. I think uh, this is a wonderful series that I'll also give the shameless plug that we'll put up a slide at the end will culminate and also propel us towards um, October, November when we have our kind of sixth annual, but first um, annual um, recognizing the work of Reagan Geisinger and uh, our foundation's kind of two-day seminar. So with that, um, I put a QR code for these slides over here above the little baby with the heart that Afif al Kufash uh, nicely supplied me and I'll share the QR code throughout the talk, and it's a link to a PDF file. But the goal today is really threefold, um, to give an introduction to hemodynamics, talk a little bit about normal anatomy and myocardial mechanics, segue into some physics, because I think that's the fundamental um, principles that all of us need to understand when dealing with echocardiography, and then show how anatomy and physics really link towards understanding some basic views in echocardiography. So we'll talk about the major determinants of neonatal myocardial mechanics. That'll be the first 15 minutes. We'll segue into what are the basic ultrasound and physics principles. And finally, I'll talk about some routine basic views where all of this comes together. Throughout this, we're also gonna have some questions as well to keep everybody uh, really engaged. Um, for those who are seeing um, neonatal hemodynamics for the first time, I think it's always important to go back to understand, you know, what are the, the components of the cardiovascular system, which in itself is part of the circulatory system. And it's kind of threefold. There is the heart, 
that acts as a pump to either the right or the left side. There's the vasculature, which is the transport network pumping the blood, which is kind of the transport vehicle to either the pulmonary or the systemic circulation. And all of this is predicated on oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery. So our first poll question uh, that Laura will put up on the screen for us today is in your experience or your opinion, and Laura, you could put the poll question up there, what is the most critical determinant of cardiovascular health in neonates? Is it blood pressure, heart rate, urine output, oxygen consumption and delivery, cardiac output, or target organ performance? I'll give everybody uh, another five, six seconds to just choose. There's uh, no wrong answer here. And uh, really just um, have people give their opinions. We'll see what everybody said. So look, they're, they're starting to come in. Great, we're seeing a, a wide variety of answers. Uh, it looks like close to 50% talked about oxygen consumption and delivery. And then we see a smothering. I'm, I'm glad to see that nobody really chose urine output view with blood pressure and heart rate. So we'll close this and kind of walk you through our approach. So for me, it's not just about blood pressure. I think that's one of the key tenements of neonatal hemodynamics that have come out over the last 20 years. It goes way beyond that. It's the relationship of cardiac output of the heart the target organ, the vasculature, and then the blood oxygen delivery and consumption. But what's key to understanding cardiovascular mechanics that'll play into understanding echocardiography is knowing that cardiac output is based on the relationship of stroke volume and yes, heart rate and eventually morphology, but understanding that to make the heart happy, you need to know what goes in the heart, the preload. You need to understand how the blood gets out the afterload, and then the intrinsic kind of properties of the heart and how it contracts with contractility. And these are the major determinants of cardiac function. So while yes, it's about oxygen delivery and consumption, it's really a conglomeration of all of these components that make up the overall health of the cardiovascular system. As one example, and I always love to highlight the work of, of Reagan Geisinger, you know, she was very interested in HIE and it really understanding the relationship of cardiac output, initially the left ventricle, and now we've learned the right ventricle and cerebral autoregulation. And that's how we link, you know, the cardiac output to its target organ, the brain in that example. So I think most people who are dealing with neonatology and cardiovascular diseases are very familiar with the different cardiomyopathies that we face. So you could have left heart disease and right heart disease. Again, you could have heart disease with congenital heart disease, but also you could have acquired heart disease with all of the different um, uh, diseases that are listed up on the screen, everything from sepsis and infection, all the way down to chronic pulmonary hypertension, BPD and arrhythmias. But before we delve into this neonatal cardiomyopathy that you'll hear about throughout the rest of the year, and especially during the lectures in October and November, it's really important to understand the basic myocardial mechanics. And I've kind of shortened this uh, part of the talk to just kind of three features to really link this all together for you. So we'll talk about embryology, morphology, and we'll talk about function. And, and for me, with embryology, I think it goes back to understanding the relationship of the pulmonary vascular disease with pulmonary disease and cardiac disease. So we'll put up question two of the polls and just really want to know what people think. You know, when it comes to embryology, it's important to know what develops first during embryology. Is it the heart, the lungs, or the vasculature? Everybody to take a few seconds and kind of think about that. And really, is it the heart that develops first, the pulmonary vasculature that develops first, or is it the lungs that develop first? And what, what's the importance of it? Okay, we'll put it up there, great. Um, so about 40% said the heart, 5% said the lungs, 57% said the vasculature. So let, let's actually take a look at this. So I think most neonatologists and trainees know kind of the different five stages of lung development from the embryonic stage to the alveolar stage. And this plays very much into all of the discussions around viability, 21 weeks, 22 weeks, but what's fascinating is that cardiac morphogenesis precedes lung development and the vasculature actually rises from a both temporal and spatially controlled process linked to both the heart 
and the lung. So these three entities go hand in hand. So the cardiac morphogenesis was the correct answer. And if you look a little bit deeper into that, just that embryonic stage, you can see the two blue being the atrium, the ventricles, the alpha tract septation, all progressing. They're also key regulators. And I, I highlight just one, GATA4, for example, which I'll, I'll show you an example in a few minutes. But there are specific features, for example, in blue, the second heart field, it differentiates into the right ventricle and its alpha tract. Again, the right ventricle and the alpha tract are linked inevitably with pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease. So you can actually see that the clinical conundrums that we all face on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be with acute or chronic pulmonary hypertension, has its links embryologically and may also have its link with key regulators. So here we have lung development around four weeks. You have pulmonary vascular development around five weeks. And then by eight weeks of age, you have this fully formed, cardiac, pulmonary vasculature, and pulmonary system where there's a multi-vessel layer that's linking all of these different three features in figure C. But if you want to link this to a clinical example, and this is why I highlight this, it's really fascinating. You have the cardiac development at two weeks, the pulmonary vascular development, and the lung development. Now the diaphragm, lo and behold, also develops at the same time between that four to eight week period. And we also have learned over time that there are key genetic regulators, GATA4, for diaphragm development. Well, guess what? That GATA4 also overlaps with cardiac, pulmonary, and lung development. And the reason I'm sharing this with everybody is as you go out throughout the, the, the year and without, throughout your training, you will grab on to specific diseases. I grabbed on to the PDA, pulmonary hypertension. I mentioned that Dr. Geisinger grabbed on to HIE. Um, Dr. Wise has grabbed onto PDA, but all of our different disease states are rooted within embryology and a lot of the key regulators. And specifically with CDH, we know there's a defect in the diaphragm, an insult on the pulmonary system, pulmonary vascular system, and a cardiac dysfunction. So let's move on. When I talk about morphology, I talk about the layers of the heart, of the heart, chamber structure, and fiber orientation. And these four features will dictate our understanding of how morphology plays a significant role in understanding the function of the heart. We know the right side is not the same as the left side. We know that a neonatal heart, for example, is about 70% water. You can hear my New York accent there compared to 30% from an adult heart. So let's look at location and orientation. Here's a nice picture of uh, Patrick. I showed this several years ago at his conference in Toronto with, with Amish, and here's him on the beach in Ireland. Um, you can see that the heart is kind of shaped like a football in the sense that there's a base of the heart and an apex of the heart. And this is in a nicely, we won't share his age, uh, grown uh, adult man. But in a baby, that, that heart or the football is rotated. So the apex, the point of you know uh, PMI is at a different location, and the base is at a different location. So when imaging an adult or a child, you have to alter your approach with imaging of a baby. What about the anatomical development? Really fascinating, and I, I didn't really have a full appreciation of this until I delved into this about six, seven years ago. In utero, the right side and the left side almost look the same. They're circular in shape, spherical. But as we progress from the first trimester to the second trimester, through birth and at one month of age, you can see that the right ventricle becomes crested and flat thin, and the left ventricle becomes round and thick. And this will dictate how we image these ventricles over time. So let's look at an example. This comes from work from Nick Evans. It's a nice cartoon where you can look this up online. You can see the right ventricle as a nice symmetric and the left ventricle as kind of spherical. The right ventricle, sorry, is, is shaped like a kidney bean, and that was a, a, a personal short axis view. And when you translate that into clinical paradigm, and we'll learn how we make these images in about 20 minutes or so, there's a normal right ventricle, kidney bean shape, sitting on top of a spherical left ventricle. And in this example, we have a significantly flattened septal wall, a pancaked LV, and if a dilated right ventricle, as is often found with pulmonary hypertension. What about looking at kind of an apical view of the, the heart? We're opening up and we're seeing the four chambers, the two chop chambers, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. 
And I'll show you in a little bit how we kind of generate this B-mode two-dimensional echocardiography image. So here's a left ventricle, it's conical. You have a myocardium and an inflow component between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And it literally looks like an ice cream cone. And you have a right ventricle, which is just so much more complex, making it so much more harder to image and understand. But you have an inlet component, an apical trabecular component, and an outlet component. So with two-dimensional imaging, it's very hard to capture all three of these components. But the group, thankfully, in Toronto and Iowa and other places have developed some novel approaches that we will learn throughout the year of how to image the right ventricle using novel 3D images or what we call like the three view apical chamber. So how do we put this together into clinical experience? Here's a normal heart, crescent RV, ice cream cone LV. You have a baby with pulmonary hypertension or some increased pulmonary vascular resistance, you'll see a thickened right ventricle. So the morphology of the heart will begin to change over time. If the pulmonary vascular resistance continues to rise, we'll have RV dilation and eventual failure as you have a thin kind of crescent RV wall. So again, morphology plays a strong role in understanding the function of the heart. So another area where we learned that there's both morphology and functional contributions to overall health is in the former preterm infants. We've learned that these preterm infants have changes in their right ventricle that are much more pronounced than their left ventricle, both during normal transition, infancy, childhood, and through adulthood. So it goes back to trying to understand the different morphological features to help us understand the function. What about the layers of the heart? You have the epicardium, the myocardium, and you have the endocardium. So we're gonna focus primarily on the myocardium, that middle la layer. We'll look at muscle fibers. And another time, probably in the fall, we'll come back and look at muscle cells and connective tissue. So. People are seeing this for the first time. It's really important to understand that there are kind of three layers of fibers that wrap around the right and the left ventricle of the heart. And I'll show this a few times, but the caricature that it's important to understand is that as the heart twists and contracts, it's these fibers that are contributing the most to the ability to eject blood, the stroke volume, and the ejection and the cardiac output. So for example, you can see here that there is kind of a top layer surrounding both the left and the right side of the heart and the sub epicardial layer. And then immediately beneath that, if you wipe it away, you're gonna see a layer in the sub endocardial layer. So let's, let's look a little bit detailed and then we'll have a table that'll summarize this. So layer one is a superficial oblique. It wraps around both the left and right ventricles in the front. Layer 1B wraps around the right and the left ventricles in the back. You have another shared layer, a longitudinal layer between the right and the left ventricle. And finally, you have a circumferential layer that's only around the left ventricle. So again, this is the first time some people are seeing this, but what's important to understand is the right ventricle has two layers where the longitudinal layer provides the major contribution to stroke volume and cardiac output. And the left ventricle has three layers. It has a deep circumferential layer where 60% is the dominant layer providing the major contribution to stroke volume and cardiac output. So you can imagine that if I had a measure that could assess circumferential orientation, it wouldn't be good for the right ventricle because those fibers don't really exist, but it would be great for the left ventricle. And as I mentioned before, some of these layers are shared between the right and left ventricle. So how does morphology function? Let's look at this together. It really is a function of preload, afterload, and contractility. What comes in the heart, what leaves the heart, and the intrinsic ability of the heart to contract over time. So the right ventricle is fascinating. I told you that it relies heavily on longitudinal fibers that will pull the tricuspid valve from resting place in, um, in diastole to its new place in end systole. You have inward movement of the free wall, and then you have traction of the free wall down here at the apex to the left ventricle free wall. So again, there's several different components for contraction, but the major contribution is longitudinal. This is different than the left ventricle. 
So the left ventricle can have concentric contraction of circumferential fibers, can have contraction of longitudinal fibers, and can even have rotational mechanics. So let's look at an example. You can have circumferential fibers. So this happens to be strain imaging, which we'll learn more about later on in the year. You could have contraction of the longitudinal fibers here in this left ventricle. And then you could have what we call the ringing or torsion, where it's really a combination of both the circumferential and the longitudinal. So the left ventricle is a little bit more complex when it comes to understanding myocardial mechanics because it's going to provide the major workflow of ejection fraction and cardiac output. So what about the overall contractile states of a neonatal heart? This is really important to understand. Many of us care for infants who have a PDA or pulmonary hypertension. And what we know is the contractile properties of preterm infants and even term infants is significantly decreased compared to adult infants. This figure A shows there's a higher collagen to protein ratio in early gestation, early infancy compared to the adult period. And when you look at some preclinical work in term infant, term lambs versus preterm lambs, there's significant moly, more fibrosis and inflammation in the preterm lamb. All of this gives us insight that the ability of the heart to contract is depressed in younger gestational age neonates and in situations where there may be perturbations or cardiac compromise. So let's look at question four. Let's put it up on the screen. So looking at neonatal myocardial performance, over time, which ventricle will be more susceptible to injury and why? Is it gonna be the right ventricle because it doesn't respond to preload? Will it be the left ventricle because it doesn't respond well to preload? Or is it the right ventricle because it has a poor response to afterload? Or is it the left ventricle because it has a poor response to afterload? So either the right or the left, and is it preload? Or after. Let's see what everybody kind of said. And this is important as we go into this study. So the right ventricle, because of the poor response to afterload, got 77%. And that, that is actually the correct answer. And I'll walk everybody through that. Why? So preload relationship between preload and stroke volume is really the Frank Starling curve. So as you put more preload in that left ventricle, the heart will increase its stroke volume and cardiac output, but only to a certain extent, immature hearts or diseased hearts can't do it to the same extent. What about afterload? If you increase your afterload to a certain extent, you can augment stroke volume, but the immature heart will not be able to do it. And data uh, for both preclinical and early clinical studies have actually shown that the right ventricle is more sensitive to augmentation in changes in afterload. And that's very much highlighted, I think, in the in the next few examples, specifically with work that's been shown, again, by Dr. Geisinger and work that's been shown by Amish Jane with pulmonary hypertension. A happy heart, as I told you guys, is really trying to understand what. What makes the heart happy? Is it preload, afterload, contractility, heart rate? What does everyone think? There's no kind of wrong answer here. It's just trying to understand the major contributions to what makes a happy heart happy. So is it preload what goes in the heart, afterload what comes out of the heart or contractility? So again, seems to be a mishmash. So I would actually argue that it's probably a combination of all of them. It's not one specific. And that is one of the key kind of messages here. There's no one measure, one specific answer. You know, a sad heart is what we define as cardiomyopathy. That's where you have impairment of the ventricle to fill with or eject blood properly the circulation. So I call this my heart clutch. And again, for those who have heard me speak before, these are all bitmojis that I try and add to spice up this talk, which can be a little mundane at times. But the key here is understanding the contributions to cardiac function with preload, afterload, and contractility. So when I put this all together, what I, what I wanna show with this slide, is really the link between morphology function of cardiac performance. So here's an example for, for everybody. Again, I love pulmonary hypertension, elevated blood pressures in the lungs, which can be defined as RV afterload. As RV afterload goes up on the x-axis, you will access your functional reserve. You will increase your RV performance. 
in the first stage, and there are three stages, under normal conditions, the RV function will be maintained. Your afterload and your RV function are coupled. But as you increase your afterload highlighted in red, your afterload is initially met with changes in morphology, RV hypertrophy that we talked about earlier, and changes in contractility. But if afterload continues to rise further and further, you have an increase in the afterload, results in RV dilatation, thin cavity, eventually RV dysfunction, and the RV performance will eventually uncouple from its afterload and lead to failure. So what you're seeing clinically at the bedside where a baby is on 100% FiO2, muscle relaxed, sedated, high frequency oscillation, and you're talking about ECMO cannulation, this is the mechanistic link between the morphology and the function. In future lectures from uh, other experts in the field, we'll talk about how we can prevent and recognize this using echocardiography. So transitioning over to kind of the second part of the talk, the hemodynamic assessment of neonatal diseases, to me, encompasses everything you see on the screen. It's clinical exam, vital signs, biomarkers, and then there are invasive and non-invasive imaging modalities. So I'm gonna focus primarily on echocardiography and future lectures will focus on cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, and even cardiac catheterization with disease-based and system-based approaches. So assessment of cardiac mechanics with echocardiography. So this is a figure taken from my good friend, Afif al Kufash, in Dublin. We're measuring the heart function longitudinally can be thought of kind of in three, three dimensions, three, three, three different approaches. You can look at it as a change in cavity dimension from diastole, the largest, to systole, the smallest. So that's an example of ejection fraction or fractional error of change. You can look at in longitudinal assessment, a change in a point. So again, the change in a point from baseline position during end diastole to its new point in end systole. These are things like tissue Doppler imaging, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Again, these may be new terms to many people. It's all just longitudinal assessment of the heart, both on the right side and left side. You can also look at a change in the shape from baseline to a new shape in systole, and that's the deformation or strain imaging that others may become more familiar with over time. So as you study each one of these measures, you will go back and remember they are assessing longitudinal function in this paradigm. There are situations, specifically with the left ventricle, where you can use strain imaging, a change in shape to look at circumferential patterns or fibers. And then you can use what we call rotational mechanics or torsion to look at how the heart twists and contracts over time. Again, this is not a lecture to have people memorize which measures go with which features. It's a lecture for people to understand the basics of longitudinal function, circumferential function, the basics that the right ventricle is different than the left ventricle. And we have to think, what do we want to measure from a morphological standpoint? from a fiber standpoint, and how will that dictate the functional assessment of what we're trying to look at over time? Here's just an example. When you think about, again, pulmonary hypertension and afterload, you wanna think about measures that can be used to assess by echocardiography. For example, the tricuspid regurgitation jet, giving us insight in the relationship between right atrium and right ventricle and pressures in the lungs. You can look at septal wall configuration, both visually and quantitatively with the eccentricity index. You can look at RV systolic time intervals. You can even look at flow patterns through shunts. But before you jump into any of this, it's extremely important to understand how do we even create these images over time. Here's just another QR code for people who signed on late. You can take a picture of this QR code. It's gonna give you a link to the PDF file. But for me, before I jump into echocardiography, it's important to understand the basic principles of ultrasound physics, where ultrasound can be used to look at the brain, the abdomen, procedural base, cardiac base, and even lungs. But for me, it's about sound waves and image production. How does the ultrasound interact with the tissues that we're trying to image? I wanna talk a little bit about transducers 
how to optimize the imaging. And I'll end a little bit with ultrasound artifacts, artifacts, but that will be a discussion for another time. So what is sound? Let's put up the next poll question. Um, so it's important to understand what, do we, what, do, what, what makes up the core parts of an image. How do we measure sound? So do we measure it by Hertz, amplitude, wavelength, or with our ear? That was uh, a, an answer I pulled from my son when I pulled him on that question. Um, so let's see what everybody wrote. How do we measure sound? You can share the answers, good. So again, we measure sound basically with, with all of these components. Um, with our ear is actually technically right, but um, really trying to be more scientifically, um, we'll go through each one of these components. So sound for me, I think about it in three domains. There is infrasound, which is below 20 Hertz. So that's the frequency. That's actually what an elephant hears. There's audible sound, which is what I hear 20 Hertz to thousand Hertz. And then there is ultrasound, which is greater than 20,000 Hertz and medical ultrasound is greater than 200,000 Hertz, which is considered to be two megahertz. So that is really what we're talking about when we're talking about medical ultrasound. So ultrasound really just consists of high pitch sound bouncing off tissues to generate images of internal body structures. That is the core. But at the core, it's important to understand that the anatomy of the sound, every single pulse that we're sending and receiving from that ultrasound probe is made up of some frequency in the probe, the wavelength, the amplitude, which could be interpreted as the brightness and the velocity. The key take home point for those who are seeing this physics principle for the first time is that the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. And that's gonna dictate some of our principles that I'll highlight over the next couple of slides. So here's the classic example. You can see my Bitmoji standing here as the train is about to come towards me. There's a normal wavelength and a normal frequency. But as the um, frequency kind of gets higher, as this, the train moves towards my ear and the sound gets larger, the compressed wavelength. So it gets closer to me, shorter wavelengths with a higher frequency. And let's see if this video plays. So we'd all agree that as the train got closer to me, the wavelength got smaller, the sound got higher. Um, and I hope everybody heard that because I heard it in my ear. And as the train went away from me, the wavelength got longer and the sounds got uh, um, uh, shorter. So clinical impact. So let's look at ultrasound tissue interactions. This is where it's important to understand all of you who will pick up a probe one day, you have the skin and the tissue. So you can send a uh, um, kind of a, an ultrasound uh, pulse towards the skin and it can be reflected. Well, if it's reflected, you won't have anything come back and you won't see any images. You can send it and it can be refracted or transmitted. That's pretty good. You can send a pulse and it can have scattering or backscatter is what we call it. That's also good. And of course you can send a pulse and some of it can be absorbed or what we call attenuated. So attenuation is just really the loss signal over time. So if you send a signal with a certain amplitude or power or energy, as it goes through tissue, you can see that that amplitude will get smaller and smaller where you have this loss of signal. So the basic principles that everyone needs to understand is that mathematically with amplitude and distance, there's a loss of amplitude. There's a loss of that image over time. So the deeper the structure you're trying to image, it may be harder because you're gonna lose that uh, ability to see those images the farther down you go. So here's just an example. What, what can you do to see this region? Okay, that's the next question here on the, on the, on the poll question. So again, frequency is inversely proportional uh, to the wavelength. So what can you do to see this, this region? Do you increase the frequency? Do you decrease the frequency? Do you decrease the gain? Do you change the focus? So if you wanna go, go deeper, 
um, let's think about are you going, what are you going to increase or, or decrease? So let's see some of these answers. We'll give it another five seconds. So good, decrease the frequency. I, I, I would agree with that. There are other ways to see that region um, gain and focus. But for now, if you can see here, what can you see? You can see the region a little bit better. And you went from six, 10 to six, now to four megahertz. And how does this apply with a transducer? Well, well here's, here's just an example. You go from 10 megahertz down to two megahertz with frequency and depth. So if you're trying to see deeper, for example, let's say in an adult, you might use a lower frequency. So that would be an example of deeper penetration, but it always comes at the expense of better detailed resolution. So let's go to question eight. Um, that Laura will put up for us. So with question eight, which frequency probe is better for neonates? Would you use a higher frequency, better resolution, or a lower frequency where you could see potentially deeper structures? Um, again, this is simplifying some pretty heavy concepts, but um, I think most people, I'm gonna guess, we're gonna choose, right, the higher frequency is it's correct. And, and, and the reason for the higher frequency is you want to use in the adults who have a thicker chest wall. You want to you be able to go deeper through that chest wall and use a lower frequency, primarily two to five megahertz. But with neonates, specifically preterm neonates, we're often using 7.5, 10, even 12.5 megahertz probes. And now everybody understands this basic concept of why we're using these ultrasound probes. Okay, generation of ultrasound. This is really important. There's really two ways to generate these pictures. There are kind of what we call continuous wave Doppler, which uses essentially two crystals simultaneously transmitting and receiving these pulses. It's good for high velocity situations. So especially when we're looking at the heart with the high velocity blood. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then the location is ambiguous. Now I, I, um, over question nine, but I'm going to put up question nine because I want to see if people can get the rest of it. So how do we generate the ultrasound pictures? I gave the answer, but is it big and small, continuous and pulse, parallel and perpendicular, or longitudinal and circumferential? What are the two types of sound waves that we can deploy in medical imaging? And giving the answer away, I, I, continuous was the first answer, and I'm sure that everybody's going to get this. This was a freebie and pulse wave is the second answer. So pulses are, 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 are really interesting. It allows the same crystals, and I'm gonna show some examples, to send and receive the images. So it measures blood velocities at a single point. It essentially sends out a signal to a certain depth and waits for it to return. And this is how we generate kind of the B-mode echocardiographic images that I'm gonna highlight in a few moments. So here are ultrasound transducers. I, I've listed a bunch of ultrasound transducers up on the screen. They all break down to three major pieces of the puzzle. There's the crystal arrangement, the footprint. So the footprint is just kind of how big they are and the frequency range. So let's look at three commonly used ultrasound probes in neonatology. You could use a phase array, which has a small footprint can have a frequency that ranges from five to 12.5. In a larger baby, one person did was not incorrect. You can use a lower frequency um, um, probe in order to go deeper. The penetration is good. And here are the indications. Here is a, a larger footprint and an even larger footprint with the linear and the convex. So let's look at that phase array. This is gonna be really important. We're gonna spend a good 10 minutes on this. So. There are piezoelectric crystals. There are polarized material within each one of these probes that allows us to send, transmit an electrical signal and essentially convert it to mechanical vibrations. But then, fascinatingly, in my opinion, it allows us to receive the mechanical vibrations, convert it back to an electrical signal and give us an image on the screen. So let's look a little bit more in depth. So within each pulse that's sent, there is kind of this wave form that I've shown you that consists of an amplitude and a wavelength at some frequency. So if we kind of look at each one of these individual waves, 
you're going to slowly see how images are formed. But to do that, you have to have a little bit of an imagination. So you have an individual wavefront, and each one of these crystals kind of acts as its own ultrasound probe, where there's some region that we're trying to image, we're trying to transmit the pictures back onto the screen. So you have an individual wavefront, you have multiple crystals where you create these nicely tight knit individual wavefronts and you have some sum of the wavefronts. And together what that allows us to do is send an electrical signal, mechanical vibrations, and then it allows us to bring it back and transmit it on the screen. And for those who are seeing this again for the first time, this is the example that I give. This is the Death Star from Star Wars. And you can see here, it's this same picture. I'm showing it again. And basically, have a sum of the wavefronts. As I fast forward this, you can see what I mean by this. And it transmits to a focal region. And to me, this is the best example of understanding how we are actually imaging and creating these images. So the ultrasound image ends up displaying on the screen as we sweep through, in this case, let's say it's the heart, we can generate these images. And I'm gonna show you exactly how we can do it. So here's question 10, ultrasound image formation, modes of imaging scanning. So let's put question 10 up. What are the most common modes for imaging scanning of the heart? Is it A mode and B mode, which is amplitude and brightness? Is it A mode and M mode, M mode and B mode, or M mode and C mode. So M is motion, B is brightness, A is amplitude. Give everyone a few more seconds. So what do we most commonly do in neonatology today? And the answer, yes, correct, M mode and B mode. And we'll spend a few minutes explaining that. A mode is amplitude. We used to do this a lot more. They use this a little bit in ophthalmology and this actually looks like an EEG. Um, we have M mode, which is motion, and B mode. So let's look at the formation. So again, what I tried to highlight is you send an image, you receive an image. You send a pulse, you receive a pulse. You send another sets of pulses and you receive these pulses. And this array essentially creates this image plane. This is an A mode. This is not something we use that often, but it's important to understand the concepts. So each one of these A lines represents an echo and they're displayed in the form of spikes on tracings where it's looking at the amplitude versus the depth. So these echoes can give us insight into what we're seeing at some specific amplitude and some specific depth. Again, we don't use this in today's echocardiography and hemodynamic assessment, but they very much look like EEGs and the principles are very much the same. What about M mode, which is motion mode? So it detects motion of structure. So it will be able to detect, this is a parasternal kind of long axis and we'll show examples, but can, it can detect as the mitral valve or aortic valve opens and closes, the amplitude is, is expressed as brightness and stationary targets are straight line and moving targets draw out waves. So some of you may recognize this M mode. This is going through the parasternal and long axis between the aorta and the left atrium, giving us insight into the LA ratio. Again, people have used this or tried to use this measure for identification of hemodynamically significant patent ductus arteriosus. And this is where this principle comes from. But the B modes, what we most often use today. And you're gonna to have to have a little bit of imagination. It's really looking at a gray level against some depth. So B mode imaging is based on grayscale imaging where the display variation of the amplitude of echoes arises from the tissue with varying shades of gray. And I'm gonna walk you through an example so you could tie everything physics you just learned back into creation of the images. So you can have the transducer that sends a pulse out to some image that may or may not be moving. And what it does is this pulse echo sequence will create kind of an image with a sample time and start to display a Doppler waveform. And by the end of this 
figure, everyone's going to understand the concepts that we've seen before. So as the transducer sends another pulse and the image continues to move, over time, it will create this sample Doppler waveform. And you have another pulse with the image moving and all the way down the sample timeline, what you end up getting is really just the sine wave that we've talked about that is frequency, amplitude, and wavelength. And what's fascinating is that this two-dimensional B-mode image that we talked about is just formed from all of the B-mode lines that's arranged and produced by this pulse echo sequence. So what you can see here is that as the pulses go up and down the line, you will start to develop these BMO lines that are different shades of black, gray, and white. And basically this is what forms the actual image that we see up on our screen. And when you look at phantoms, which we created here, the signal returning from the body is really divided into pixels. It's just all of those waveforms multiplied over and over and over again, where the brighter may represent bone, and the darker may represent water or blood with each tissue having its own different gray level matter. And if you wanna make this, for example, brighter, increase the brightness, all you're really doing is increasing this signal ratio where you're making it more white with a higher amplitude compared to black, which has a lower amplitude. Again, for people who are seeing this for the first time, it's all rooted in the physics. It's all rooted in amplitude, and frequency and generation of pulse echoes, which allows us to create these images on the screen. So here is how it translates into the clinical echocardiogram. Here we're placing a probe at the apex of the heart and we generate this nice picture where we have a Doppler scale, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. We have a probe orientation. We have an EKG. We have the color Doppler field. And we have this nice B-mode, two-dimensional echocardiogram that we've now created using all the physics principle tools that I've just spent the last bit of time talking about. So let's look at color Doppler. What it's doing is it's estimating the mean velocity. And basically, the probe you can see there at the marker, and we've learned there is the red towards the probe, so red towards the probe, that is blood going from the right atrium to the right ventricle with the highest mean velocity that's providing an estimate. And blood that would go away from the probe, blue away, that would be going from the right ventricle to the right atrium. So that's an example of tricuspid regurgitation jet velocity or what we would see in a baby who had elevated pulmonary pressures or pulmonary hypertension. Truthfully, in this case, it actually looks a little bit yellowy orange because it's having turbulent blood flow that's both going to and from the probe. So this mnemonic BART, blew away and red towards the probe, now can be linked to the physics properties behind the mean velocity in Doppler interrogation. So I put up a question 11 there and I didn't pause to do it, but let's put it up just for, for, for sake of, of looking at these poll questions. So the highest detectable velocity is the probe encoded in red, away from the probe and encoded in blue, towards the probe and encoded in blue, or away from the probe and encoded, encoded in red. So again, BART, blue away, red towards. I think I gave everybody the answer. Laura can put it up because I think most people are going to get this right off the bat. Again, red towards the probe is the highest mean velocity and it's blue away from the probe. So in this case, on the screen that we were seeing that's left there is you have blue away from the probe. That means that blood is going away from the probe, right ventricle to right atrium. That's the TRJ. So beam characteristics is really important. You have a near field, closest a focal zone and a far field. And I spared everybody from the German terms. The focus knob allows the ultrasound beam to focus on the area of interest. Let's look at question 12, Laura. We'll put that up on the screen. So you can see in every ultrasound probe, there's a marker. And the marker on the probe, does it represent the near field, 
the focal zone or the far field. This is extremely important to understand. So give it another five seconds. So the marker on the probe actually represents, here's the answer here, the near field. It represents the near field. So when you have the marker on the probe, it's representing the near field. This is extremely important as you learn to hold the transducer, and this will become more evident in clinical practice of how you manipulate the transducer to understand the images, imaging that you're created. And I'll, I'll give an example here. In pediatric cardiology, Marker is placed here down at the left ventricle of the near field. In adult and pediatric cardiology, it's actually inverted and the marker is placed up here. And in adult emergency medicine, the marker is placed on the other side. And finally, in neonatology, neonatal hemodynamics, we, we stick with this orientation that I've been showing you, where the marker and the near field is down here at the left ventricle, corresponding to this B mode echocardiographic imaging. So let's look at ultrasound scanning and planes. This is really important to understand. So there is the transverse plane, which is the short axis plane. There is the sagittal plane, which is the long axis, just long axis makes sense. You're going through the long axis of the heart. And there's the apical plane, which is very similar to the coronal plane. So I'm not gonna spend all the time to go through all of the different basic views of the heart. However, it's important to just show you the apical, the long, and the short, so you can understand how we slice the heart, the long axis, the short axis, and the apical planes. So yeah. the five different approaches, again, subcostal, apical, parasternal, parasternal, look at the PDA, and suprasternal. Again, there's different approaches that everybody will learn over time. The apical view is often what we start with, but the subcostal view can also reveal a lot of information. And I put this clock here because this is going to help you understand with orientation as well as probe placement, near field versus far field. So here's just an example of the apical views. There are multiple apical views. I'm not going to review them all, but there's a four chamber view, a five chamber view we'll look at, two chamber and three chamber. Again, these are some different views to help us look at the left and right ventricle respectively. And then there's a pulmonary artery view. So let's look at that apical four chamber view. The, the, the marker of the probe is placed at three o'clock and it allows us to generate the following apical four chamber view of the heart where you have the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. And you can see here that this is just a normal two dimensional B mode imaging echocardiogram with normal function. And you can even put the Doppler flow, okay, blue away and red towards the probe. So that is right atrium, right ventricle. And here is an example of an RV that's dilated. The septum is bowing. This is not necessarily the best view to look at septal morphology. And if you look at a probe, so this is similar to what I showed you with Doppler echocardiography, you can see that it's blue away from the probe. So this is a TR jet. You can also use the apical four chamber view, potentially look at the septum. It's not great, but this is AV canal right here. The arrow is pointing towards. And then I don't think you need to be a neonatal hemodynamics clinician to see what's sitting in the left ventricle. That is an example we had several years ago of rhabdo. Um, so again, the apical four chamber view is often the starting point to give you a sense of the relationships of the right left atrium to the right and left ventricles. So what about the five chamber view? We angle up just a little bit, twist towards 10 to 11 o'clock. I highlight this because you're changing your probe, but it's all about orientation. And again, this is just a basic concept to give you a sense. More insight will come as we look at clinical indications later on. You can look here, the left ventricle goes into the left ventricle outflow tract. So you have the five chambers, the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, and LVOT. Here's an example of normal function, normal flow with Doppler flow patterns. And in this case, the probe is down here at the apex here. And what you're seeing is that the blood is going away from the probe. So going from the left ventricle out to the left ventricular outflow tract, and that's normal blue away. So it's really important to understand the long axis. So again, here I put an example up on the screen here. Probably go through this a little faster to be able to get to 
questions and panel discussion at the end. But as you slice the heart, according to the long axis view, you can look at the left ventricular outflow tract, the right ventricular inflow tract, and the RV outflow tract. So let's just kind of look at this. So again, it's all about probe placement, which won't go into much depth now, but it's slicing the heart along the long axis. And it's really allowing us to look at the relationship between the left ventricle, the outflow tract, and the right ventricle, and even the left atrium. And what you can clearly see here is that if you have a dilated right ventricle, you can really see a nice relationship between the right ventricle and the left ventricle to understand, are there any perturbations or ventricle septal defects? As I showed you before, this is a great way to look at M or motion mode imaging. And here we'll do um, kind of three uh, cases, which I showed early in April. I borrow this again from Reagan Geisinger's work, but let's put up the poll question here. So this is a parasternal long axis. You have impaired filling. You have the right ventricle, the left ventricle, left atrium. So this infant's on a high frequency oscillation, mean airway pressure of 22. You have low blood pressure. So what do you want to do first? Do you want to augment preload with fluid? Do you want to help reduce afterload or augment contractility with milrinone, augment contractility with epinephrine, or just wean the mean airway pressure? What, what would everybody want to do first? You have these kind of kissing septums. And again, thank you. A lot of people wrote fluid bolus is not incorrect, but I would probably start by weeding the mean airway pressure. And that is the, the, the answer. So what about severe RV dysfunction? Again, we've seen this in several talks before. Would you want to augment preload with fluid bolus? You know, impact contractility with milrinone, but it could come at the expense of lowering afterload, epinephrine to augment contractility or wean the median right pressure. Let's look at the example. This is an example of severe RV dysfunction. So if the blood pressure was stable, you could give milrinone, but I probably would give epinephrine as my first choice. Fluid bolus and preload is not necessarily incorrect, but you can see how the right ventricle is rocking back and forth. And finally, the last question here, if you have severe septal hypertrophy, like we would in an infant of a diabetic mother, this is the true kind of kissing um, that we see here. What would you do first? Would you give a fluid bolus? Would you try and lower the heart rate? Would you give epinephrine to augment contractility and raise SVR to impact the blood pressure? Or would you then give uh, uh, an answer to wean the mean airway pressure? And let's see what people chose. Again, lowering the heart rate, Fluid bolus gentle is probably the right answer. Maybe consideration of some vasopressors afterwards. So this is just an example of tying in the imaging that we've learned, the physics we've learned, and then understanding the normal neonatal myocardial mechanics. So I'm not gonna show this one. We'll go a little bit faster because I wanna leave some time, but long access, there's ways to look at the inflow and the outflow. But what I wanna get to is kind of the short axis view. So the short access view, we'll go back one slide, really allows us to look at the aorta, mitral valve or papillary muscles, and the apical view. So this is just scanning from top to bottom, looking at this short access view. And what's really awesome is you can look at the aortic view um, and you can use this view to really look at the coronaries, but also look at the relationship of the aorta to the pulmonary system with relationship to the left ventricle. And here's just the top of the short access view. And as you kind of pan down, you're also gonna be able to kind of look at the mitral valves and also the papillary muscles. And this, I've shown this already early on in the talk, gives us a great sense of the relationship between the right ventricle, the morphology, and that left ventricle. And here I'll just go fast forward just a little bit. You're gonna see an example of a flat septum and you're gonna see a a dilated right ventricle, really give us an understanding of what's going on potential with morphology and function. And this is a great view to also look at the relationship of the ventricular septum to see if there's a defect at all levels. We can look at the apical level, the mitral level, and even down to the, to the uh, even up to the aorta and then down to the apical. So image optimization, um, 
We have a few extra minutes, so I will talk about this because I want people to understand how the physics ties back into some of the things we do on a daily basis. You could have a beam that's reflected, highlighted on the screen, or you can have a beam that's refracted, which is just a fancy way of saying transmitted. So overcoming impedance is really important as you go into neonatal echocardiography and hemodynamics. So you can send an image that could be transmitted. You can send an image that could be reflective. It's reflected, you're never gonna see it come back to the screen and you won't ever see the image. And truthfully, it's all about the medians. So if the medians, the impedance are the same, it'll be transmitted, which isn't such a bad thing. But if medium one is so much smaller than medium two, all of the signal will get reflected and that's not good. The perfect example is the air tissue interface where 99% of the beam is reflected. So none is transmitted. So if you stick a probe and you try and look at the heart, you will see nothing because all of the beam is being reflected. So the question is how overcome acoustic impedance? Laura, you can put up the last question there. So do we, we can't, is that true? We hold the probe off the skin, gel, image, your water. I, I will uh, highlight the fact that I, when I first started out in my career about 10, 15 years ago, the first project we ever did, and we can put the answers up on the board, is actually I imaged underwater because that was the only way to overcome the acoustic mismatch. But the answer is actually you add gel. And what you can see here is that by adding the gel, and here is a picture of the gel between and this is neurosonography between the probe and the skin, what you are essentially doing is you are decreasing the reflected beam, this impedance from 99% air soft tissue down to 0.2% between water and soft tissue. So again, this goes back to understanding the ultrasound and tissue interactions and understanding the physics and core principles. So again, just some little things so people can be familiar with. You can adjust the depth. As you go deeper, this is the, the IJ and the carotid. It measures how far the ultrasound will penetrate. You can adjust the gain. It amplifies the reflected signal. So here on the left is a poorly amplified, a, a, a darker image, and then you adjust the gain and it increases the signal to noise. You can actually do this in simultaneously processes where you have gain on the y-axis, depth on the x-axis. And there are also these time gain compensations, which you all learn about when you get your hands on an ultrasound probe and machine. Here's just an example. The, everything is aligned. You can see it on the machine. But as you adjust it for the depth and the ultrasound noise, this comes from a phantom we did many years ago. And here's an example of centered versus adjusted, it's more clear, the image is more precise. I'm gonna end with, with just ultrasound principles and artifacts, because I think it's important for people to know. Ultrasound machine makes several assumptions that are not always true. Sound travels in a straight line, not always true. Sound travels directly to the reflector and back, not always true. Echoes arise within the main beam, not always true. And sound is attenuated uniformly. I've shown you that's not true either. It can be reflected, reflected, scattered, backscattered. As such, the tissues are different. The lungs are different than the heart, different than the brain. So it's incumbent on the imager to know what is interference and what is diagnostic clues. A perfect example of a diagnostic clue is lung ultrasound, which is a whole talk unto itself but you can have reverberations from the bone in figure A, or you can have reverberations that get impaired in figure B with these B lines, with your fluid in there. That is giving us context information as we talked about, diagnostic clues. And finally, you could have parasternal short axis. You could have almost, it looks like there's two aortas, but this is an artifact or mirroring. This would be interference. This has something to do with the way this was imaged. So with that, just kind of sum up, we've talked about what are the major determinants of neonatal myocardial mechanics. The goal of the heart is to supply the blood to target organs 
focused on cellular metabolism, oxygen delivery and consumption. And these processes are linked to both structural, morphological and functional mechanisms. The basics of ultrasound, we need to understand how images are produced, A mode, M mode, B modes, the pulse wave echocardiography, the B mode imaging, the tissue characterizations, why do we use gel? What are the differences between the transducers? We talked about uh, the frequency. We talked about the, the, the image production. We talked about the phase array probes and we talked about the footprints. How do we optimize the images? And what does it mean by ultrasound artifacts? And finally, it's important to understand that physics is intimately related to both myocardial performance which really dictates the echocardiographic and hemodynamic findings. So I'm gonna end with this bio effects imaging. This is, this is the pitfalls. This is what you don't want to do. And the reason we're having these lectures over this year is ultrasound can be a useful tool, but it also could be detrimental. This is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and with that, I want to just acknowledge uh, Danny, uh, Danielle, and thank Laura Thomas for helping me uh, stay on par with our poll questions. And I'm going to open it up to the panel and answer any questions. Thank you so much, guys, for the opportunity. Looking forward to another great year.